So good afternoon. Um, I'm Roman Sherbakov. I'm a member of the uh, board of directors of AFI's Baltimore chapter, and I'm a director with Clifton Orson Allen CLA. Uh, CLA is a professional services firm delivering integrated wealth advisory, outsourcing, audit, tax, and consulting services with uh, over 120 locations in the United States with a global um, reach uh, through next year. So thank you very much uh, for taking time out of your busy days and joining us uh, for a presentation about the new accounting standard AC 842 leases. Uh, first, just a few words about FEI, which, is, which stands for Financial Executives International. <clears throat> so FEI is a member service oriented organization for senior level financial executives in the companies um, in varying sizes, both public and private and in all industries. So if um, we were to have a polling question right now, um, I would probably ask you, how old is FEI as an organization? Um, is it 20 years, 50 years, 90 years, 120 mm -hmm. years? And the answer is uh, that this year is a 90th year of the organization. Um, FEI's mission is to advance the success of financial leaders, their organizations, and profession. Um, FEI enhances member uh, professional development through peer networking, career management services, conferences, events like this, research and publications, and members participate in the activities of FEI in more than 65 chapters uh, in the United States, and we have our um, chapter in Baltimore. Um, so um, just uh, very briefly, upcoming events uh, that our chapter will have, um, obviously today is the event on the leases. On September 22nd, uh, the event about uh, vaccine mandates presented by Saul Ewing uh, is a full service law firm uh, with offices through the East Coast, Illinois and Minnesota. Uh, if possible, uh, could everybody mute their microphones of, uh, you know, speaking, thank you. Um, in October, October is the Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and FEI, together with uh, PSA Insurance in Financial Services and CLA, will hold an event surrounding cybersecurity matters. In November, um, it will be about managing ESOPs, presented by Christine Hart, Chief Financial Officer of Aries, Sand, and Gross. And in December, um, it will be a presentation about internal auditing for non for profits. So now a quick sales speech before we continue. So if you are already an FEI member, thank you. If you are not, please consider joining FEI. And um, my understanding is FEI National has just dropped their membership um, dues to $299. So please join. So now to our presentation. Um, uh, may I present you Michael Luff. Michael is um, a project leader, a CASP project leader, which stands for Consulting and Accounting Solutions Team at CLA. Uh, Michael has over 25 years of experiences in a variety of industries um, and, and the public accounting, in different public accounting roles and industry roles, um, specifically to um, accounting um, accounting standard implementations, I would say probably for the last, since the public companies um, had a requirement to implement the revenue recognition standard, M Michael and his team worked with um, working with these companies on implementing first the revenue recognition standard and now, or, or recently um, the lease standard and now working closely with a variety of uh, privately held companies um, mm -hmm. on the lease standard. So, Michael, I'm turning the microphone to you. Thanks, Roman. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us uh, come in and and have a, a conversation. Of, it, it's 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 lunchtime where I'm at, probably where you're at, and nothing better than uh, lease accounting to really kick the afternoon off. Uh, as as <clears throat> as Roman said. The group I'm with is a consulting element of CLA, and we we have had a lot of experience with lease project adoption projects, right? So with the public companies, 
that um, you know that had to adopt this a number of years ago. Fortunately, I would say for for the entities, and also I will say for governmental entities, uh, we've had a bit of a delay in what was originally the adoption date. So we've still got time, which is great. The presentation today, I think, is I think is interesting because it's not just it's not really talking about lease accounting it, it seems like everyone is aware and understands the mechanics of of what the lease accounting standard requires you know versus uh, under ASC 840. Um, we'll touch on some of the elements briefly at the start uh, but the majority of the um, of the of the focus really on our conversation today is related to uh, really the practical considerations of, of working through the implementation, right? What do we do? How do we kind of get our arms around what we need to do related to this lease standard? And what are some of the things that, um, that other folks had to kind of learn, learn their way through? And, and we'll talk about those today. And hopefully um, it, it, will, it will at least spur some thinking and kind of give some folks some actual practical um, practical things to think about. Uh, you know, as everyone says in a presentation, if anyone, as I'm talking through a particular topic or subject, if anyone has a question that comes to mind, please feel free, unmute, um, and just uh, let us know that we have a question and, um, and we will uh, love to hear that in real time. Likely, as everyone knows, you're not the only one with that question. Um, but uh, feel free to, uh, to, to throw those at me and see if we can't, uh, you know, kind of provide a little extra, a little extra color. All right, we'll skip the disclaimer. So I believe this is slated for CPE. So we do have learning objectives as an initial slide. So we're going to identify key elements, general step-by-step -step process for implementing the standard. Um, recognize some leading practices, what lessons have been learned from other implementation experience, and uh, how do we apply some real world example scenarios when it comes to talking through what constitutes a lease, which is really uh, another way of saying we're going to talk about embedded leases, which is a, a, a topic that is um, needs to be addressed under 842. We're going to talk about what those are, why they're important, why the definition of a lease under the accounting standard is important to keep in mind as we're working through that overall assessment. So those are the objectives. <clears throat> and just to start off very, very basic, right, is, a, and is something we, we will refer back to but we want to make sure everyone's oriented on the definition of a lease. <clears throat> and again, this is an accounting standard definition. It's not a legal definition, but it's what the uh, FASB decided when they drafted ASC 842 that this was these were the key elements that uh, need to take uh, that need to be <clears throat> present for us to treat a particular um, arrangement as a lease. So the definition is a contract, a part of a contract. And uh, there's two elements. It conveys the right to control an identified asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration. So period of time, exchange for consideration, those are easy. These uh, two other elements, right to control an, <clears throat> an identified asset. So let's take the, the second one first, um, an identified asset. So for us to have an arrangement that is considered a lease, then we have to have an identified asset. It can be explicit or implicit, which is really not a big deal from a definitional standpoint. But the second element that the board uh, included in this um, criteria is that the supplier has no practical ability to substitute or would not eco economically benefit from substituting. So <clears throat> where this could come up as we're looking through our uh, vendor contracts in our assessment of embedded leases, there can be uh, 
a wide variety of different fact patterns that need to be considered <clears throat> when we think about these vendor arrangements. And a lot of times what happens is we'll start to look into a particular arrangement, but as soon as we see that the vendor actually is turning, you know, they, they'll provide tangible property, but they will substitute that at their, uh, you know, at, at their control. They, they control when those are substituted. Um, some examples, we've had hospital systems that have um, arrangements with laundry services, but as part of that, there are uh, actual garments involved and the garments are dropped off, they're used, they're taken away, they're clean, new garments are provided. So that's just a constant churn of substitution of those actual assets. They're not always on site. So that's one significant criteria is identified asset that's not being churned. It actually is, is an asset. And then we've got this idea that there is a right to control the asset during that term. So two pieces to that criteria. One is who's really using it, right? Who's making decisions related to that asset, how it's being used? Is it that the vendor brings an asset with them to perform their job? Well, then that's not going to be a, a, a not going to meet the definition of a lease to us as a, as a purchaser um, <clears throat> because they're really bringing assets on, let's say, a job site and they're using those assets to do their job. The other aspect of the right to control criteria is whether, you know, we have to assess whether or not we are obtaining substantially all the economic benefits. And so I, I think the <clears throat> The key example in the in actual, I think, is part of the example in the guidance talks about these billboards on the side of the interstate with rotating digital advertisements that are shown and, and kind of rotated on the billboard. Um, the companies or the groups are paying for advertising. And yes, they get to show their ad advertising copy on a billboard. But because it rotates, they're not the only ones that are enjoying the economic benefit of that billboard. So it really has to be a situ situation where we as a potential lessee would have to be obtaining all the economic benefit from the use of a particular asset. So that's the broad definition. Um, any Anybody have any questions on that just as we're talking through or I'll keep going. Ah, okay, number one polling question. See if we can get this to work. Holy question number one, what is your level of familiarity with the new leasing standards? So A, knowledgeable, B, somewhat knowledgeable, uh, D, C, not very knowledgeable, and then D is a kind of a joke, but there are people answering D, so that's good. Okay, so I think this is really good. As I'm seeing the responses in real time, majority of the folks are in B or C, so somewhat knowledgeable. And this is kind of the, the, the concept of this, these, this group of slides, this presentation is, we've got some knowledge, we've, we're aware of the standard, um, and we know we've got a project to tackle, but what are some things that we need to think about as we're talking about uh, trying to come up with a, with a game plan on, on some of these items? So that's great. Thanks for the answers. Okay. All right. Well, so let's let's get into it. Okay. Here's the overall agenda. Three key elements in any implementation. And again, this is based on our experience. One is there is a need to identify all explicit lease contracts. So it's pretty self-explanatory. We want to we want to make sure we have the full population of all of the contracts for all of the leases where they're explicit. We know there are leases. We lease office space, we lease a building, we lease ground, we lease vehicles, we lease office equipment, we lease IT equipment, <clears throat> et cetera. But there's a contract, we know it's a lease. Uh, we're booking lease expense or rent expense. So that's the first hurdle is identifying all of those, make sure we have a full population. And for each of these, we're gonna get into more detail, but this sets the stage. <clears throat> the second key element to consider is whether or not you would need 
<clears throat> a special purpose software tool that acts as a subsidiary ledger for all of your uh, lease records and your lease activity. It's analogous, I will just say, to a fixed asset sub ledger where we load in our fixed asset costs and we, we uh, inform the system what the depreciation life and methods are and it runs the calculation, it provides our disclosure reports, it pro provides royal forwards for audit and is really our, uh, you know, again, it functions to generate the entries that are ultimately booked on the uh, general ledger. There are special purpose tools that do the same thing for leases. We load records in for each of our lease, um, our leases, our leased assets actually we'll talk about. We load in the future payment stream, we load in a discount rate, you know, obviously a description of the lease, et cetera. And then that uh, software actually creates um, calculations that we'll use to record our assets and liabilities and ultimately our monthly or annual expenses and update our balance sheet accounts and just provides that stable controlled environment for all of our lease accounting um, needs. The last element we alluded to it earlier in talking through the definition of a lease per the standard is the uh, requirement to assess our vendor population as to whether or not we have embedded leases in our vendor contracts and arrangements. The answer is likely going to be uh, not many, if any, but the issue is, is that there is a need as we adopt the standard, there is a need to assess for these on a, you know, looking at our total population of vendors and thinking through all of our arrangements because that's just never been done before. It is a requirement of the standard. <clears throat> and so it's another step that needs to be taken as part of this project is to, uh, to work through that. And again, we're gonna get into each of the three of these in, in a lot more detail and, and invite any questions. We'll have a few uh, minutes to discuss some other considerations uh, related to things like discount rates. You know, if, if you're part of the group that is familiar with the standard, this term that they used in the drafting is uh, an incremental borrowing rate in theory. And so we'll talk about that, what the implications are, what the different options are to uh, think through how do you how do you develop uh, a, an approach to concluding on the appropriate rate to use for the discounting? Uh, we'll talk about other process changes, the fact that this does impact other areas apart from accounting. So it's, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Maybe it's operations or facilities and just being, being tuned into the fact that the organization now is gonna have to have a bit more, maybe a bit more cross communication on uh, leasing activities. And why start now is, well, it's already August, so kind of late, but we'll get there. Um, okay, three key elements again, we skip that. All right, number two, polling question number two, are there groups in the audience who have already uh, understood that, okay, it was part of the adopting a lease standard. I really know, need to know where all my leases are and have made uh, some progress in gathering those contracts. So, um, you know, they're all in one place, they're all accessible, and then we can assess what we need to do in terms of uh, kind of planning for the project and understanding how big the project is based on the number of contracts, et cetera. All right. <clears throat> so it looks like about half the great group has, is indicating that they have all of the explicit lease contracts. So congratulations, that's uh, fabulous. That could be a major chore depending on the size decentralization and complexity of organization. So that's great. Uh, there's uh, about a third of the group has not done that. And uh, about a fifth of the group is not sure. So but that's good. All right. So let's talk about gathering my explicit lease contracts. Okay. So first place to start, likely good first place to start is you know related to our typical commitments and contingencies footnote there was um there was likely a schedule put together that uh, detailed out the various leases that are enforced and that formed the basis for our disclosure in our footnote about you know related to future future commitments future lease payments and 
uh, for five years and after, et cetera. That's a great place to start. I will say that I don't believe we've ever started with that and that ended up being a full list. It's a good start, you know, but folks take an approach that, hey, if it's not a big lease, it's, you know, sort of smallish, we'll leave it off. Some folks uh, take an approach of, well, we're just disclosing our real property leases, right? Any real estate and ground leases, but any equipment vehicles, we've left them off the list. But anyway, so that's a good place to start. The best place that's going to be definitive that we'll end up is looking through our general ledger and looking through our transaction details. Because we are, if we're paying lessors based on these contracts, then we should see that we're booking some sort of lease. There's a lease expense account or there's a rent expense account uh, in the general ledger. And so we want to go through and pull the detail for that, those expense transactions, say for a, a month or two months, then we, whatever system or platform, ultimately that expense was the result of a payment to a vendor. We cross-reference through maybe the accounts payable system. And then we understand what our roster is of all of our lessors. And if we have a lessor, then we are sure that we have a lease contract somewhere. And so we want to take our approach of, you know, we started with our disclosure support. We think we've got a good handle on a, maybe even a majority of the leases. We go through our general ledger and we determine that, okay, here are all the lessors that we're paying on a periodic basis. And then that would, that should, you know, those two things together should, um, provide us a good roadmap to determine, okay, what, what contracts do I need? Um, and then work with, if it's legal or procurement or the CFOs, you know, whoever maintains those contracts, that should give us a good roadmap to be able to say, okay, I want, here are the list of the vendors, here are the list of the contracts that should be available. Um, and, and ultimately that's sort of a checklist approach to, concluding that we've got everything that is out there. So is that is that pretty sensible? Pretty good. Another couple of things to think about related to explicit leases. Once we have all the contracts, not every single contract is gonna require, um, let's call it an elaborated capitalization calculation. So once we get all of our explicit lease contracts, it's a good time then to maybe read through all or some of them to think about categorization. For example, under the standard, if we disclose that we've made it an accounting policy election not to capitalize short-term leases, so it's, in a, it's available, we don't have to capitalize them, but there is a, we do have to acknowledge that we are availing ourselves of that option. So if we're not going to capitalize short-term leases, then we can take those leases and, and really set them aside because we're not going to need a calculation to take the future payments discounted to a present value and uh, support our ROU asset and lease liability balance. We're just going to make sure that those are short-term. One thing to think about on short-term leases is that that is a disclosure requirement under 842 is our short-term lease expense during a year. So we'll want to think about, and we'll get to some other suggestions, but we want to think about uh, having a, an account in our chart of accounts to capture that short-term lease expense, just to make it easier to support disclosure when we get ready to do our footnote. Then we want to think about splitting the, the call them long-term leases, right? And anything greater than 12 months. Um, and just to clarify, short-term is 12 months or less. So if it is a 12 month lease, that's short term. It's not less than 12 months. So as long as it's one year or less, then that's going to be short term. Everything else, I would say, would probably, I would want to categorize those in real estate and non-real estate. The reason why is because real estate leases typically require a bit more follow-up and a bit more careful assessment of what we've recorded in the books for ASC 840, because real estate leases are the leases that typically have escalating payments during the term of the lease or over the life of the lease term. And under 840, 
we were we we were obligated to be recording our P and L expense on a straight line basis, which may only for a certain period of time during the lease match exactly the cash that we were paying. And so there was always a need, if I'm gonna recognize a straight line expense in the early years, the expense is gonna be greater than the payment to my lessor. And so I've got this deferred rent account that starts to appear in the books to square off the straight line rent versus the cash. And then that deferred rent account grows and then shrinks over the term of the lease. So it handles that timing difference during the life of the lease with escalating payments. When I adopt ASC 842, that deferred rent balance goes away. It doesn't exist after 842. What happens is 842, as it takes an operating lease and it forces us to capitalize an asset and a liability, the asset and the liability are not gonna be the same amount in a case with escalating payments. And so the difference as our starting point or beginning balance is made up by debiting off any residual deferred rent um, that, that are, that's on our, our ledger. And so I would wanna take the real estate leases and understand there's more work I'm gonna have to do. The same holds true for, we've had a real estate lease where the at, <clears throat> at the commencement of the lease, maybe the landlord provided some tenant improvement allowance which is very, very common from a bookkeeping standpoint under 840, that was to be a debit to cash or credit to unamortized TI allowance. So that credit would then be charged off uh, over the life of the lease uh, on a straight line basis. And so at the uh, adoption date of 842, we would have theoretically some unamortized tenant improvement allowance liability on our books that would be also um, debited to zero and folded into the right of use asset balance going forward. So real estate leases, a bit more complex. Non-real estate leases, that's kind of what's left over, which is anything anything that's not real estate. It's vehicles, if it's uh, office equipment, IT equipment, um, that type thing. Then we also want to think about whether we have any lessor. <clears throat> you, know, we, you know, if we're predominantly, predominantly a lessee, where we are, you know, it's an expense lease from our point of view. There could also be contracts where we're lessor, where we're collecting lease income or rental income. Uh, no real change under 842 as far as how we handle that as a lessor, but it's a good time to just re review the accounting that we've got in place, our process for straight lining our, our lease income if it is not a one stable payment over the term. The other category of you know, or idea of thinking through, okay, great. I've got all my lease contracts that that guy said I had to pull together. I've separated them out. I've put my short-term leases to the side. Uh, fantastic, now what? Well, that's great. But a lot of times what happens is just because we have the lease contract for a particular uh, situation, um, we may not have all the information that we need in order to um, methodically perform the calculation that's required, right? Because the calculation is, when did I get use of the asset? What's the start date effectively? What's the end date? What are the payments? What's the discount rate, et cetera? Well, a lot of times lease contracts themselves may not have the right dates. You may not know when those computers were dropped off or when that, uh, or occupancy date. When did we actually move into a particular space if it's real property? Because the contract just said, well, what, upon issuance of the certificate of occupancy by the local regulators, well, when was that? Now I've got to follow up. So just bear in mind, having all the contracts is great, but also keep in mind that as you're working through those, there may be other follow-up. We've had to go, I've had to go after, you know, receipt documents of when things were left or dropped off or brought or when was the CI, when was the certificate of occupancy. Another thing that comes up sometimes with real estate leases, you know, we touched on this idea that very, very common to have um, the landlord offer a tenant improvement allowance. But a lot of times in the contract itself, it doesn't specify how much, it specifies a mechanic. 
uh, it'll say, well, up to a certain ceiling, but it's only upon, you know, agreement based on receipts from approved contractors or subcontractors, et cetera. So the, the follow-up is, well, how much ultimately did we support? How much did we receive, et cetera? So just getting into the, getting into the notion of just having a contract, there may be other pieces and parts to uh, talk through. Is there any other question on just the, the bare practicalities of gathering all the contracts and thinking about all the data that's required? Does anything come to mind? Anyone have any question to ask? Oh, good. I'm gonna do it on time. I'm doing good. Um, I'm sorry, Michael. I can't find this. Uh, I cannot find this question. For some reason, this one didn't get loaded up unless it's out of order. Nope, I don't have it. Okay. Okay. Well, just keep keep going. Sorry. Okay. All right. So obviously, based on the question, the next topic is you know we uh, we've touched on it, but have we thought about how we're gonna track all of our lease details in a way that we will have this ongoing again the analogy is fixed assets you know every month there's another slug of depreciation every month i could add more assets i could dispose of assets same thing with leases so we really um we we, we want to think through how are we going to handle that um are we going to use my excel can't we just load these copies the Excel and and be done with it. And I think the answer to that question is, of course, um, I would say if it were me, I wouldn't suggest using Excel to do this if I have more than a handful of leases. Uh, I would say, let's say 10 is more, you know, that's not a bad way to look at it. The issue with using Excel is it's great to calculate all the accounting calculations, you can generate all your journal entries for a lease in one worksheet. It's fabulous in that. But once you start having 20, 30, 50 lease calculations and trying to summarize all that data and make it user friendly and make sure I'm not picking up the wrong journal entry from the wrong period because Excel is a little bit less, um, it's just not a database. It really is good for calculating the lease entries and verifying that well, I've got the right number for a particular lease, but it's not very good at kind of carrying that forward. And as we all know, there's a lot of risk of error. So I think- the, Michael, we have a question. Fabulous. Um, Luella wants to know, how do you know when office space started to be occupied? What is the document that supports that start date? Yep, so typically, um, what we find is there, there would have been someone, and let's say in an organization generically, it would be someone who would be a facilities manager who would have been working with the landlord and getting the build out done and making sure everything was, um, make, make sure everything was taken care of and the inspections were done by the local inspectors working for the government. And at some point in time, everyone's happy with everything and there's a certificate of occupancy is typically what it's called there's a document and that actually allows us as a tenant from our standpoint to move in. So that would trigger the start of the lease. The facilities manager is likely the best person to start with. If one of the other folks is maybe in a smaller uh, organization is, is deals a lot with contracts, maybe a, a, a legal you know, someone in a legal group or an outside attorney, even in a smaller case, may um, may have been involved in ultimately, you know, that documentation, that those would be the folks that I would start with. <clears throat> but yes, good question. And we'll talk about that. This is, I mean, it's an accounting standard, but it's, it does require some coordination with other groups. Um, Michael, we have a participant that's asking, if you can re recommend any particular software. Oh, I sure can. I sure can. Um, I would uh, I would say, you know, as a, as a firm, right, CLA is a, is a, an accounting firm, we, we, I guess, decided to take an agnostic approach. We don't partner with any of these software vendors. We don't, 
really recommend one over the other. We like to, you know, provide some suggestions of, of some tools that might be, that, that we have found and we have experience with, working with, that we can say, yes, this would be worth a, a demo, right? So the first one I would say that would be worth looking at is called Visual Lease. So just like it sounds, B-I-S-U-A-L, Lease. <clears throat> I would say that Visual Lease started as an, a lease administration software. So tracking all your leases, when are my notice periods? When do I need to vacate? When do I need to turn in? All, the, all those decisions and administrative steps around the related to lease activity. But then they developed an accounting as you would expect. Then they, they said, okay, well, lease accounting. So let's, let's develop a, a, a essentially additional functionality. So they've done that. It, it's, it's a good tool. It's uh, cloud-based. All these are cloud-based tools. Um, I would say if I had a fairly significant population of leases and I have somewhat regular turnover of leased assets, that would be in the vein of one I would think would be good um, because it is a little more, it, it's, it's user-friendly, but it also has more features. If I want, if I have people keeping up with my, you know, if I've got six real estate leases and people are keeping up with those in a Excel spreadsheet, <clears throat> I may want to use visual lease because it has functions, but it's more expensive. You pay for that. One uh, tool that is on the more accounting focused um, track is called Easy Lease, capital E, capital Z, Lease. I hate that they may name it that. It's a good tool, but I always sound like I'm endorsing a used car dealership, you know, Easy Lease. But it's a good tool. Um, it's very, very easy to use. It's very, very practical, particularly if you have less than 100 leases. It can be used for more, but I think that's that's a good way to look at it. Um, it is very uh, it's very flexible because there is no configuration of the tool. If you sit down and if I've got a situation where I've got twenty leases and I sit down and say, "Well, this is how I'm going to group these together because I want to bookkeep my lease expense and my lease balance sheet information at a department level versus just sort of the top side and in consolidation kind of thing, then it just requires a little bit of planning of how I create the records in the database so that I can pull the records. I'm going to assign department numbers that are unique codes. Obviously, we all understand how that works, but I do that all in the easy lease as I'm entering the record. So I'm, I'm I'm doing it on the fly versus let's say a visual lease where you have to sit down and before you start, before you even get the tool, you'll have to work with the vendor to configure the system and give them all your department codes and your expense account or your account numbers and all of that information gets built into the system, which is okay, but it just takes longer because they have to do it. They don't, you know, that's not something that, that you do as a user. Whereas easy lease, it's easy. You, you just have to be organized and methodical. Um, there are others. Lease query is pretty ubiquitous. Um, uh, lease accelerator. But I would say the visual lease, if I've got a bigger, more real estate focused portfolio and could use some of the real estate lease admin function, and absent that, I'd say easy lease would be another good one. So those are the two that I would start with. And if you Google it, there's like 50 guaranteed. And I will, I will, I almost forgot this. Um, the other thing to think about is bullet point number two is does my current ERP platform offer a lease accounting subledger? So for example, NetSuite, if you're running NetSuite or certain versions of Microsoft Dynamics, there are application developers that have created essentially integral. In, integratable, I don't know if that's a word, but tools that are built for those platforms that handle lease accounting. And that's definitely a, a great place to start also. Uh, maybe even better and more, you know, better than just a cloud-based tool because it's already in there and you can just set it up to your 
uh, going back to that word configuration, you kind of make it work for your configuration of NetSuite or Dynamics, whatever it is. But think about that as a as probably a first step. And then the different cloud-based softwares. The cloud-based softwares, typically what happens again, if we think about it, every leased asset that we have, we would want to set up one record. Even if I have a, a even if I have a situation where I have a master lease and I've got 25 vehicles under one lease with enterprise, let's just say, those vehicles are constantly churning. And so there's no way to have one lease record in a subledger that's going to do the calc correctly because almost by definition, these vehicles are going to have different start and end dates. And so there's no way to really capture everything as a, a, under a master lease, it really does come down to, you have to have basically a, a separate record for each individual asset. So people talk about having a record for each lease and that needs to be clarified. Um, contrast that with, a, I've got a lease agreement with Dell and Dell every three years drops off 30 laptops. And every once in a while, if one of them kind of goes out, they replace it. But I've got those 30 laptops. I got them all on the same day. I'm giving them back on the same day. I'm getting my new new batch with new technology. Then yes, yeah, so you can you can have one record in your subledger, um, and then come up with a way to allocate the expense. However, you allocate other IT expenses. But just be aware. Just because it's a master lease depends on how it operates and, and what really are the underlying assets that need to be considered. Um, Going back to software, going back to the process, it's really nothing more difficult than just going and doing a Google search and finding the vendors, the vendors. And there's a button, you know, request a demo. And they will, you know, if you request that, put information in, they'll they'll have folks that'll come back and and you know ultimately connect with you to set up a demo. You kind of see the tool, see how it works. Um, ask questions about it, and then, you know, get all their pricing information. So it's, it's really nothing more magical than that. Um, Michael, uh, we have another question in the chat. Fantastic. Will the original certificate of occupancy be needed if the new rental agreement was entered into when the first lease reached the end date? No, that's the leases are long-term. Yeah, great question. And again, from a practical standpoint, we might have leased a, a let's say we leased a, an office or a built let's say a building right so we leased a building and we had an initial lease of 10 years and then you know that lease expired and then we had a new lease and that lease was at, you know extend it was really an extension but it was a new it was new paper there wasn't an adopt, there wasn't an option to extend the original lease we had to we had to execute a new agreement then it's really the date that the new agreement was in force because we would already be in the building. So we would say, yes, we have control of the building. We are the only ones receiving economic benefit for the, you know, we're in it and it's identified as why it's not substituting. So going back to that definition, the, the issue with the first lease, if it's the first contract in a series, you know, we may not know exactly when did we actually take uh, possession but if we're if we say okay our, our first ten year lease is up we're signing a new lease we've already got possession so it becomes more clear just based on the uh, the effective date so to speak of that next lease or any subsequent lease for that matter right I think that makes sense um, anything else on the count the subledgers uh, one thing to think about typically the subledgers are self-contained, right? They're, they're cloud-based, so you log in, you enter your data, you can run reports, and they'll give you your disclosure, quantitative disclosure reports, give you, uh, they call them amortization uh, reports, but basically it'll show you the calculation details based on the data inputs, and it'll also show you all your debits and credits for the life of the lease, which can be helpful just to kind of get get your hands around that that's that's really what you would create in excel um otherwise it also shows you your journal entries and that's really important because ultimately 
what we need to enter into our, our books, we got to have some journal entries. And so um, we would need, we would, uh, we would be able to get output from the system. And in our experience, those outputs are typically in Excel. And so then it's just a matter of mapping, okay, what is the raw output? You know, where's the corp code? Where's the account number? Where's the account code? Where's the debit and the credit? Is it bracketed? Unbra and you can basically take their raw record and then kind of come up with a, a bit of a manual bridge just to resituate the fields in the record layout so that it matches up with how your general ledger system ultimately accepts a journal entry record. So it just makes it, you sit down once and map it out and fix it so that uh, when you, <clears throat> when a journal entry is generated from the sub ledger, then you know that ultimately it's going to be in the for it'll be in the format that you need it so that someone can quickly get it uploaded or entered into your general ledger system, if that makes sense. But I don't see anyone just if you think about like an API, like trying to build some sort of uh, interface between the sub ledger and the general ledger, I, I would caution against that. It's just it's too much. Okay, well, I'm ahead of myself. So subledgers configure, yeah. The, again, we talked about whether it's easy lease where you're essentially configuring it record by record or whether it's like a visual lease situation where they will configure the system for you. The issue that you need to think about is do I wanna book these entries top side or do I wanna book these entries at a detailed level, department, division, cost center, et cetera. So that's just a decision that accounting needs to make. Um, just again, practical, you know, just so you can kind of think about it. Once you get the, soft, the software available, you run a test batch through, you look at the output. So you, before you run, if I've got 50 leases, I might want to run through three or four just to make sure everything looks like uh, what I'm telling the system is right in terms of where's the department code. Am I getting the right department code, corp code, ledger code, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do I understand how these journal entries are created? Um, do I understand what the debits and credits, uh, how those accounts are, are, are going to be impacted? Just kind of like do a little sample before um, maybe do a manual calculation, right? Everyone wants to, the, those tools, all the calculations, right? What that really does, if I do a manual calculation and somehow I've gotten some sort of date confused or a, a process confused, it'll usually be helpful to do a manual side calculation, maybe in an Excel, uh, to ver not that the software is not working, but just to verify that I've got the right information in the right spot and I've kind of thought through the information I need and I'm telling the system the right way. <clears throat> all right. Any questions on the software and the sub ledger and all that? I, you know, again, just trying to be very practical about it, not not suggesting that there's one right answer for everyone, but you know, hopefully folks can kind of get an idea of what those, what those tools are, why they're important and how we're gonna use them. Uh, polling question number three, have you thought about updating your, um, your chart of accounts? I don't know which question this is. There may be another, there may be another question coming up that's more in line with the accounts payable, but We'll go with this. So this is, uh, we're getting kind of mixed reviews here, about a third, a third, and a third. Folks have uh, thought about, uh, this question that we're talking about is really, have we uh, thought about updating our chart of accounts? I think there's gonna be a question a little bit updating our accounts payable process that we'll get into. Um, so about a third of the people have, a third of the people haven't, and another third are not sure. Um, so let's think about that for a minute. I think I've alluded to it a few times talking about short-term leases, but the way we kind of look at it, let's just look at if, if you were sitting down with a piece of paper and a pencil and thinking about a chart of, you know, what do I need in my chart of accounts to accommodate ASC 842 accounting? Okay. And some of these accounts may exist and some of them may not. I think that's always accurate. All right, so the first thing I'll need, I need an account and the def, the terminology and the standard is a right of use, right of use, right to use is GASB. You talk about right to use an asset, but they named it right of use asset. But in the chart of accounts, we wanna separate the operating 
leased assets, operating leases versus finance leases. And we want to have a right of use asset account for each because that's going to play into our disclosure. And clearly from the subledger, we're going to get different entries that are based on whether the, this is the, these, these, this subset or the operating leases. Maybe we come up with a summary journal entry for those. We've got um, finance leases in another subset, but we maintain separate accounts so that everything's kind of traceable you know, from the footnote through the trial balance and then down to the subledger. Uh, lease liability, right? So there's going to be as most liability accounts, there's probably a short term and a long term. And then again, split between operating leases and finance leases. So I have, a, I have an account for each. <clears throat> I have a short term and a long term for each operating and finance. Uh, one of the ones that we need to keep in mind if we've got an uh, disclosure requirement of what were my short-term lease expenses for the year. Obviously different ways to do it, but what I would do is I'd consider establishing uh, an account. So I'd capture my short-term lease expense just as, as my, as, as accounts payable as coding the invoice. Let's make sure we understand which ones are short-term leases. Let's code that expense there. <coughs> I'm not sure who all is in the population, but a lot of times there are leases that will have a variable, a variable component to the lease. So for example, it's very common for a, a lease of retail space. The, the terms of the contract will be um, the lessee will pay X say 10,000 a month, um, the greater of 10,000 a month for the 12 months or 3% uh, of sales, whichever is greater. And if 10,000 a month for 12 months is $120,000 and they have high enough sales and 3% of sales is 130,000, well, then they're gonna have their fixed base. They knew they were gonna pay the minimum was gonna be 120, but now they're gonna have to cut a check for another dollars. Well, that's not part of the capitalization because it's future, it's unknown, it's not fixed base rent as prescribed by the guidance, but it's variable lease expense uh, that needs to be captured for disclosure. So that's a word there. I, again, my approach, because I'm not that smart, would just be to open up a chart, uh, an account on the chart and, and book it all there. Um, operating lease expense, we probably have it. Probably doesn't need to be anything new there. Um, interest and amortization expense under 840 for capital leases. We you know, would have been booking interest expense and amortization expense for our capital leases, probably have those accounts. So um, might wanna change the terminology or might not, but those, those the, the P and L side, those are all required uh, for operating interest and amortization. And then I think this is kind of getting into a more of a suggestion, but I, again, if it were me, I would, I would consider setting up a clearing account on my balance sheet for lease to, to use just for lease accounting. Some people don't like using clearing accounts, but I'm gonna, I'll walk you through sort of the thought process of why it, it seems to be a good idea. I'm thinking about my next slide here. Okay, that last account, this is really the, and I think y'all have already answered, so we don't need to go through that again. Um, Michael, I'll go ahead and pop up the last question that you wanted launched. I'm really sorry, I don't know how these got out of order. But just for CPE, they. Oh, that's okay. Ahead. Yeah, sure. Let's say okay. we, so. This is the question of what we talked about about you know, you know, everyone gets so far into thinking about contracts and subledgers and all this, but yeah, but there's some things we can do today because, you know, quite frankly, there's some some ERP platforms or general ledger platforms that it's very easy to open up uh, new accounts, and some of them it's quite cumbersome. So I always like to bring up that we hey we're going to need some new accounts here. About half the folks have, have yep, we're going to need new accounts, and and the, the rest of the folks have maybe hadn't hadn't quite got that far, but we like to bring it up. So thanks for that. Um, this question on the slide is the question that was answered before. Have we thought about our accounts payable process and changes that may not may need to be thought through related to uh, lease accounting? So let's think about why that would be. So. You know, stepwise, first step would let's let's look at our accounts payable process related to how do we how do we uh, uh, you know pay our lease invoices to our lessors or our landlords, uh, 
let's look at our current journal entries that get recorded. Um, who's keeping up with deferred rent, for example? Um, are there other elements in the bill? There, there most certainly are. A lot, of, a lot of places, leases, there's sales tax that gets applied to leases. Um, if we are in a real estate lease, the, there may be an estimated monthly CAM charge, right, for common area maintenance that we're obligated to pay monthly. We could get a monthly uh, estimate of our property tax and insurance portion for, for real property, for example. I guess our suggestion is we really look at who's handling the, the invoices and paying those and processing those because it's going to be it's going to be helpful as we think about implementing it, whether it's a subledger software or whether it's we want to put it in Excel. Either way, we have to think about the fact that all we're putting in Excel to support our capitalization of right to use asset lease liabilities, <clears throat> strictly the fixed base rent. We don't add CAM, we don't add sales tax, we don't add taxes and insurance. It's just the fixed base rent. But what happens is when we get a bill and AP is coding the bill, they're coding the rent for that month, so to speak, but they're also having to handle the sales tax and everything else that comes on that bill. So it really just, the idea would be, let's look at what the bills are, let's look at who's processing this um, because you know we're gonna need to think about the bookkeeping mechanics. The last bullet point there, again, we touched on it earlier. If we've got deferred rent that we've accumulated a liability over the course of uh, some contracts under 840, the same as unamortized tenant improvement allowances, we want to think about going ahead and gathering those supporting work papers. So we know the we, we, we need those balances, but they have to be at the least asset level. The, the overall balance isn't that helpful. It's that we have to we have to know for each lease that we set up in our, our, our subledger that we know how much of that deferred rent balance is related to that lease so that we can set the record up correctly with the ultimately the asset and liability balance. Um, <clears throat> tied to specific lease contracts, rolled into the REU balance. I think we've kind of overkilled this one. That may be an odd slide. Okay, let's go back and talk about the accounts payable process. Unless I've got a polling question in the wrong place. No, I don't. Let me go back and talk about the AP process before we dive into embedded leases. Just to round that out, I thought I had a slide. Um, if we think about it, the way the, the subledger is going to work, you know, we've we've basically fed the subledger we're making these monthly payments for this lease. And the subledger is going to say, okay, you're telling me you're making that payment. I'm going to calculate the right expense. I'm going to calculate the right adjustments to my asset, my liability based on those payments. So when the subledger generates a journal entry, part of the journal entry is a credit to cash. And then all the other debits and credits, but part of it's a credit to cash. Well, in theory, that cash is already gone. We've credited cash. AP credited cash when it paid the bill. And so if I think about it, I know that the credit out of the subledger can't be cash again, because I've already done that. I also know that if my invoice coding from AP is include entry, an entry or a few entries related to the fixed base rent that I've already told the subledger I'm paying, well then let's say that AP expenses that on a cash basis and not keep a track of deferred. Well, I've already, I'm already gonna have an expense. And so what we suggest or what I suggest is I work with AP when they get a bill, if they've got a bill that's got sales tax and CAM and all this and, that, and the rent for this month is X. Well, I want a credit cash. I want the debit for that rent. I want a debit to a clearing account because why? Because when I run my subledger journal entry, now I've got all my expenses and my other debits and credits, but I've got a credit to cash. I want that credit to cash to be a credit to that same clearing account. So I'm always in sync with, I know accounts payables probably paid this on the first of the month. I'm getting ready to close my books for the month. I'm generating my monthly subledger entry. 
and I know if they've paid hundred dollars that I've got a credit to hundred dollars that's going to wash in my clearing account. And I know that what I've told the subledger <clears throat> I paid is what I've paid. Because what happens in certain cases is we've told the once you tell the subledger you're paying it, it assumes you've made the payment. But what happens a lot of times, not a lot, sometimes, um, companies will get to the end of the year and they'll get to December and say, hey, you know, we're thinking about our balance sheet and thinking about our liquidity, how it looks. Let's hold off making some payments and then we'll double up in January just for balance sheet purposes. Well, that's fine. But then all of a sudden you're, you know, your subledger is thinking you made a payment on December 1st of X and you may make a payment of 2X on January 1st. Now, is that materially different? Is that gonna cause a major headache in your financial statements and your balance sheet? No, probably not. But if you're a controller or in, in an account, you probably wanna know what's going on. Um, also, you could just have something that just doesn't quite work right and have an issue and if you've got that clearing account in place if there's an issue with the payment to a to a landlord or to a lessor then it just helps so i'll i'll stop there um i worked through an assessment of vendors okay so there has is a small group so 10 12 percent have worked through an assessment of vendor contracts to um think about whether or not we have potential embedded leases the majority have not done that yet okay So just to start with a basic definition, right? An embedded lease, and most people, as we're accountants, we've read about this lease standard. They've really harped on this concept of we really need everyone to look for embedded leases. Not sure why, but it is what it is. So what is an embedded lease, right? So embedded lease situation that may exist in a vendor, in a vendor arrangement, <clears throat> Where the, where the vendor, right, so it's either a service provider or a supplier, they employ tangible property as they provide the service or deliver the supply. There's some sort of tangible property that is part of the arrangement, but the arrangement isn't a, a lease. It's a supply agreement. It's a service agreement. But as part of that, there's tangible property that is in the mix so to speak. And this all goes back to the first slide that we looked at where we talked about the definition of a lease. Because now we know it's not a lease. Now we're assessing these various fact patterns. But we really need to <clears throat> we really need to keep in mind the four elements of what defines a lease under the standard. Okay. Um, Assessments required to determine whether the tangible property would be considered a leased asset in compliance with the standard, as we talked about. Why this thing is not okay. All right, let's get some examples and throw out. If you got questions or think about something, throw them out and let's talk about it. But I'll walk through these. Hopefully, we'll stir some thinking. <clears throat> IT service contract. Okay. Well, I pay an IT service provider. They house my data. They house my applications. I don't want to own hardware, great. Uh, is that a lease? Well, maybe. And the reason it could be is because if your IT service provider who has a big server farm, as part of your arrangement with them, they have to keep your applications and your data on a particular specifically identified machine, right? We run into this a lot with healthcare because of the HIPAA regulations related to patient confidentiality. They can use an IT service provider, but that hardware has to have security related to it. So they have to have a specific piece of hardware for their IT needs because of that. Otherwise, if I just have an IT service contract and that company can move my, as long as I have access to the electrons, they can move my stuff. My applications and data can be moved within their server farm to accommodate their capacity utilization issues, it's not going to be a lease, but it's, it bears the question, right? Um, another very common example is we work a lot with schools and school districts and hospitals, cafeterias, right? So cafeteria serve a con service contract. We may have a group that comes in and they bring the food, they bring the people, they cook the food, they serve, all that's terrific, but they also brought in some 
let's say refrigeration to be used on site. Well, we're paying them to serve food. Um, but as part of that, they bring refrigeration units because that's gonna be helpful for what they need to do. You know, think about it. it's on our site, specifically identified. We're saying when the cafeteria is closed, so we're really determining the use, right? And it's only for our economic benefit and no one is substituting that. Once they load it in and they sit it there and they create their layout, so definitely could be a could be an embedded lease in our cafeteria service contract. Uh, the next one's very common where I am. We have a lot of bio uh, medical uh, research type situations where there's a lot of folks in, in labs. Um, a lot of the labs will have a contract for uh, gas, chemicals, and different gas and things like that. The um, the it's a contract for the material or for the fuel. But a lot of times vendors will install a depot tank on the premises so that when the customer needs more, they just come and back the truck up and they fill the depot tank, which is usually a big white oblong thing sitting outside. And then the researchers or whoever will come and use little separate receptacles to bring that material into the lab. Well, that tank is on our site, it's not being substituted, it's only for our benefit, we're controlling when it gets filled and when it gets emptied, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, it's an embedded leased asset. Um, now we get into the stupid magazine article examples, which <laughs> are not kind of goofy and immaterial. Uh, water coolers, right? I've got a guy, I've got Poland Springs, bring, I've got a, there's a person who brings in these big jugs of water and sets them up on the stands. Well, they also probably gave us those dispensers as part of that contract if we agreed to use them for water. Well, the dispensers in theory just conceptually would be an embedded lead. We're paying for water, but we're getting the use of the dispenser. We decide where it goes, when it gets refilled, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Vending machines or soda fountains. You know, same thing if we decide or if we if we agree that we're just going to use uh, pick one, I don't care, Coke, Pepsi products, then Pepsi or Coke, the local distributor probably give us a vending machine put in the break room or on the floor of the plant or whatever. Well, you know, we're paying for soda. We're not paying for that vending machine, but we get the use of it. It's just for us. We're controlling where it goes when it gets filled. Um, it's identified. It's not being switched out. So. Those are some examples, right? Real world examples, except for the last two, they're kind of goofy because even a vending machine is not going to be super material. Does anyone have any other questions about, well, wait a minute, we do this. Is that going to be a problem or is that an issue? And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, you have to be a little bit curious about different arrangements just to kind of go through the thinking and, and think about the definition. Um, uh, Chances are it's really not going to result in a lot of differences in your lease accounting, but it's really just the the um, the requirement to do the assessment. Um, yeah. Michael, we, yep. we have a question. How do, you, how do you determine the cost of the embedded asset? Oh, yes. Great question. Um, people use that term, right? More art than science. <laughs> you know, that's that, that's kind of what happens. Um, what typically comes into play if we think we really do have a case, and I'm gonna get into a little more specifics, but let's just say hypothetically, what it requires is the standard requires us to take our fixed base payment to that supplier and allocate that base amount between the leased asset and then the service or supply. And so I'm essentially carving out a portion of my payment to that vendor and I'm going to recharacterize that or I'm going to call it a lease payment and the way I'm going to quantify how much of that should be considered a lease payment is very judgmental based on the asset itself on the retail the fair market value of the asset on the estimated useful life of the asset and you know, apply that in, in, with some judgment and I will come up with a way to assign or allocate a portion of my spending with that vendor to that leased asset. So it, it, there's not a prescription for that. It really does require just a little bit of creativity. And 
you know, anchored by a few facts here or there and judgments. Anything else? Let me keep going. Uh, I think this one will be pretty quick. I think I'm getting, oh yeah, we're getting there. Uh, in bed at least, all pur purchase activity from the entire list of vendors. Okay, so here's where we're getting to the real, now you, you listen to all this and you're like, okay, what am I gonna do? What do I, how do I do this? Here's how you do it, in my opinion, or in our opinion, this works. So I would take my total vendor list, my total population of vendors, <clears throat> and then I would identify the vendors that are in my term, casual, right? Where I only issue a PO from time to time. I wanna identify those versus my vendors with whom I have a contract, preferably long-term. So <clears throat> the PO only vendors get shaded off the list. So they drop. If I've got vendors with whom I have a short-term contract, I drop those. So I really only want vendors with whom I have a long-term contract. And now this has nothing to do with tangible property. This is just getting through paring down my total vendor list, okay? So then I take my vendor population of vendors with whom I have a contract that's greater than 12 months. So that's small population, smaller. Now, the tricky part is in that vendor contract, do I have a minimum spending requirement in that contract? And the majority of the time, the answer is no. But the reason why it's important is if I don't, I can discard it. The reason why is if I don't have a minimum spending requirement, I don't guarantee them, I'm paying them X, I'm guaranteeing them a volume of purchases, there's some sort of take or pay type, there's not a minimum spend, then based on the standard, there would be no amount that would be characterized or allocated to represent fixed base rent. And if I can't meet the definition of fixed base rent related to the consideration I'm paying a vendor, then I would have no way to capitalize any balances on my balance sheet. So that's really key because I could have, I could have the vendor like we talked about, let's say take the the supply tank idea. And I'm running a lab or I'm running a manufacturing facility and I need compressed gas or I need this or that. And I've got a Amerigas or one of the big you know, vendors and they bring and they put a tank and they put all that. And I'm like, oh, okay, I've got a lease, an embedded lease. But I look at my contract and my contract is, well, okay, we're gonna agree on our price per volume of you know, whatever it is, right? Cubic feet or whatever but there's no minimum payment. There's no minimum spending requirement. There's no minimum volume. So even though I've got this tank out there, okay. Yeah, is it an embedded lease? Yep. Can I account for it in any way whatsoever in compliance with the standard? Nope. Okay, I'll move on. I don't even wanna know if there's a tank out there because I don't, there's nothing I can do, right? Um, so I'm kind of being a little bit overly dramatic for an accountant, but I mean, that's a big deal. And I'll just tell you, as embarrassing as it is, you know, the first couple of projects and you go through this and you went and found this tangible property and oh my, you know, we got all this. And then we got to the question, which we should have asked early on is, okay, what do I do with it? And the answer was, well, nothing. Because there's no minimum spend. There's no amount that can be capitalized. So uh, that's that's why we, we want to suggest that that be a, an upfront consideration. Then you get into, okay, is there even tangible property at all in the contract? I mean, is it with a law firm? Well, probably not, you know. So then you get into the, is there tangible property? Yes or no. Then, you know, then you get into the definitions, right? So you got to say, I've got a contract vendor. It's got tangible property. Also, there's a minimum spending. And then we get into the fact pattern related to how that tangible property is being used. Who's using it? Do I meet the four criteria um, to, uh, you know, help me determine whether I meet the definition of a lease or no, right? Um, if the conclusion is that the embedded lease exists and requires capitalization, that's when you get into this idea that you, you've got to take that fixed minimum spend and then come up with a creative way to allocate a portion of that to the lease, the hypothetical lease. If you do that, then you basically load that 
lease into your calculation subledger and it gets treated as any other lease. That also brings up issues and problems with ultimately coordinating with accounts payable. Because if I'm already going to book lease expense in this hypothetical scenario, then when I pay for my supply as I'm paying that, if, as I'm meeting my minimum spend requirement, a portion of that's already been accounted for in the subledger. So it gets just tricky. <clears throat> I would say that in the majority of cases, I would not expect more than one or two embedded lease situations that, that actually require accounting. So hopefully it's not too onerous. Could even be seen to be immaterial and say, maybe I've documented my assessment. Maybe I've reached my conclusions and maybe on a couple I concluded this does meet the definition, but I've decided that I'm not capitalizing because it's immaterial. So that's always a, it's always a thought. <clears throat> any, any questions? I think I'm done with embeddeds. We, we, have a, we have a question, Michael. Um, how would the new standard be implemented? Is it retroactive? Um, you can. You can do it if you like. But uh, fortunately for most folks, um, there's not a requirement to adjust any prior period presented statements. They didn't call it a prospective approach. They called it a modified retrospective approach, which just wonder what they do there at the FASB. But basically you disclose that the transition method that you're going to use is the modified retrospective approach and it's basically <clears throat> prospective. So you know from for most folks right let's say 1231 year in so for your 1231-21 financial statements you publish those done they're done and then you get into 22 and by the time you get to the end of 22 your P&L and balance sheet need to reflect 842 compliance assuming a US cap audit. And you just disclose that your transition method is, is modified retrospective and move on. All right, embedded leases. Okay, I got a polling question, Denise, are we out of polling questions or are we, are we in for one more? Are we out? All right, which is, this is clever, which is not one of the three elements. So there's four answers. Plus I'm not sure. Um, maybe everyone's left polling question. Yeah, material right. People hopefully know. We talked about it, you know, three three big areas of focus, right? Identify my explicit, lease, explicit leases and gather those contracts. Determine my approach towards how am I gonna track all of this and, and bookkeep everything and have control in a subledger whether it's a lease software, whether it's Excel, it's, it's got to be dealt with. And then the third thing you got to deal with is this, uh, you know, assessment requirement for embedded leases. A material right is a concept under 606 that uh, has to do with, you know, could current purchases giving you a right to future discounts, et cetera. So that was the tricky answer. And, and there are some people that don't know. So there you go. Not sure. All right. Let's keep going. Couple more slides here. Keep me honest on time. I think I'm getting towards time. Um, a couple quick ones. Let's see what time is it. I got a ten minutes. Uh, discount rate, right? So, what does the standard say about discount rate, and how can we use this? I mean, how can we come up with a practical approach? Discount rate in the definition, it should be first. First idea is you should be able to sit down with your lease contract and figure out what interest rate you're being charged by your lessor. Um, it happens. I won't say it never happens, but it never happens. Um, once in a while we'll get, I, I've got a construction services company that we were working with and they would get a fleet of like pickup trucks and the lease agreement would actually have the original invoice from the dealer and you could back into the rate, but typically you default to your second step would be, well, what's the lessee's incremental borrowing rate? In other words, it's a hypothetical concept. I, I don't know how they came up with this, but they came up with this hypothetical concept, incremental. If I went hypothetically to let's say a bank and I borrowed, wanted, wanted to borrow money, incremental to my current borrowing reflected in my financial statements. So if I borrowed more, what would hypothetically the interest rate be on which the discount rate would be calculated 
to reflect the judgment of my credit profile if I were to borrow money and the payback were the same payments I'm making to all of my lessors and landlords over the lives of my current lease portfolio. So basically, there's a couple of issues with that. But the, in the end, if one wants to take this incremental borrowing rate approach, it really is just a matter of talking to your banker. Most bankers are very familiar with the standard, at least ones that have customers that they, they help, you know, help them facilitate their financing. And they'll be very familiar with, with this. It'll typically be, you know, in, in range of what you would expect if you were having to negotiate some additional financing. Um, it's specified to be collateralized. Obviously the term can be different if I've got a lease portfolio and all my leases are gonna end in the next five years versus if I've got a lease portfolio blended between 20 year real property leases and three year IT leases, then my weighted average rate is gonna be somewhere in the middle. I would, uh, if it were me, I would, I would use one rate for the entire population of leases. The idea of trying to come up with, well, I wanna use rates for specific term under five, five to 12, 12 and over, whatever, I wouldn't do it. I'd just come up with sort of my weighted average average length term outstanding and I would just use one rate for everything. Uh, the rate, once it gets set at the time of adoption, it's only reassessed if you have a change in the term or change in a conclusion related to purchase option. Um, Less ores, you're not having to worry about it because you're not using a discount rate anyway. Uh, I would say, hopefully I've got this on the next slide, but if not, I'll mention it. Yep. Uh, primary source of financing, right? The lender. Bankers are aware of the standard, generally receptive. You know, the first, when we were doing the public companies, the bankers were very, very uh, hinky <laughs> about providing someone anything that said, hey, we would loan you money at X rate. You know, they don't want to do that. But now I think everyone understands it's really strictly for accounting purposes. And they can paper it however they want, but from an accounting and auditing standpoint, it's just good to have, even if it's conversation that gets documented or an email. Um, but look at the last bullet, right? So that's really the out. And that's really what I would suggest most folks take advantage of. So the FASB did allow for private entities implementing 842 that you can use a risk-free rate. So what's a risk-free rate? Well. It's, it's you go on the U.S. Department of Treasury website, and there's a T-bill yield curve, and that's the risk-free rate at various for various terms. So if we go back to the idea that some people are going to need, a, you know, conclude that their portfolio of leases is on balance, a 12-year time horizon, some are three, et cetera, et cetera, it, it'll give you different rates for different time horizons. That's a hideous word, but anyway. Um, uh, you might want the eight-year rate, you might want the three-year rate, you might want the 15-year rate, <clears throat> and it's objective, it's always there. The only downfall, and I'll mention it even though I don't like when people mention this, if the you know that rate is gonna be necessarily lower than an incremental borrowing rate because there's no risk premium that's been in, uh, you know involved in coming up with the number, it's risk-free. Uh, it's a lower rate, it's a denominator in the calculation. So it's gonna, this hypothetical right of use asset lease liability balances that are already just hypothetical funny money, they're gonna be bigger because the rate is lower. So it's, is it a downside? No, not really. I don't think it's a downside. Um, I, I would, I, th this is what I would do because every year I'm gonna have to come up with a new rate, right? I'm gonna have my new, whatever my additions are, et cetera. And I'm at that well, and I'm always just going to go back and get the risk-free rate as it evolves over time. It's easier. Um, hey, Michael, got, yep. got a question in the chat. Um, is there a private company alternative for discount rate? Yeah, that's what I've been talking about for the last five minutes. Yep. You just use the risk-free rate. Just use that T-bill rate. I would not, I would not use the, the incremental borrowing rate. That makes sense. That is 100% the recommendation. Okay. Um, process changes, we briefly talked about that. Uh, it depends on the size of the organization, the decentralization, the, the complexity. 
uh, <clears throat> a lot of a lot of places leasing <clears throat> is not super important. So you know, facilities folks, operating people, manufacturing managers. There's a variety of people that may be involved in signing lease agreements historically, but now that all the leases need to be at least and likely put on the balance sheet and controlled by accounting. There's just thinking about a new process to make sure all the lease, lease contracts are filtered through ultimately accounting so we know about them and we understand that we've got good control of maintaining that completeness of the subledger. So definitely think about any internal controls uh, that would be required from a overall communication within the organization, different groups. Um, <clears throat> make sure we have some internal controls to capture the lease contracts. We keep our subledger current, keep it updated. Um, a lot of times what we've seen too, the last bullet talks about <clears throat> rethinking how the organization handles leasing activity in general. Um, one of the early one of the early situations that that uh, that I was involved in, the company had been leasing a phone system. So this, you know, I guess fairly sophisticated hardware and switchers and this bunch of equipment, and they were leasing it from a vendor. And I think that ultimately the conclusion was they could have bought everything for. 400,000 some odd dollars and over the life of the lease and the extensions they've paid like seven hundred thousand dollars and they called him up and said I th we think we're we think we own this now we're, we're, we're gonna not pay you anymore and we're gonna keep it so uh it's kind of a goofy example but it just having to deal with lease accounting is likely you know be 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 aware that you know just looking at leases and thinking through leasing that exists today will will at least drive some questions if not ultimately maybe some some changes nuanced or otherwise in, in how you handle leases and, and that type of thing summary uh yeah we talked about areas so talk through areas of impact right current current business activities, you know, what, what are my vendor arrangements related? Again, the ongoing maintenance of an embedded lease assessment. Um, how centralized is my lease management? Do I want to keep it decentralized because I want operators to be able to get the resources they need, but ultimately I want reporting to be centralized because I have to have it for accounting purposes. Uh, contract negotiations, just highlighting whether we lease or buy and just kind of being aware of some of the, and not for everything, but maybe some significant, you know, items, uh, fleets of vehicles, maybe it's, you know, buildings and real property. Um, you think about how you're negotiating those. <clears throat> budgeting, budgeting is going to change. Obviously, your forecast of balance sheet is going to have to include these REU assets and lease liability balances. Probably have to apply some some forecasting to those. If you, if, you know, if we get into that, um, I would say P&L forecasting doesn't really change. The operating expense is still there. The interest and in amortization on capital leases is, is still going to be there. So P&L wise, it's not bad, but, uh, but um, balance sheet wise, we're going to have changes. Financial IC, IT systems, yeah, I mean, again, may want to consider a software subledger, may want to think about when some major IT decisions are being made rela related to tangible property, related to hardware, um, you know, and how does that play into my, le in my lease strategy for, for securing assets for the company. Uh, internal controls, yeah, and then key metrics. Metrics, uh, this is probably a good last point. Um, I'm not going there yet. Good last point. So think about if I've got now, I've got a bookkeep, uh, lease liabilities on my balance sheet, but I've got bank covenants where I've got a, a, a liabilities to equity ratio. So just in general, um, again, just from our experience, most bank covenant agreements are going to have a, 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 a section or a clause where it talks about the fact that if upon adoption or upon a new accounting standard being required for adoption, we, both sides agree we'll sit down and figure out what it's usually there and if it's not there it, it's probably worth a phone call but again the bankers are very very used to this 
Um, one of two things usually is obviously going to happen. One is it's going to be carved out. So this, you know, maybe other carve out. So just ignore the impact of 842 to your, to your ratios. Uh, the other thing is, well, let's just re, let's revisit the ratios or provide some, you know, flexibility and kind of reset them based on your current lease activity, which is probably not that, I, I would, I would guess it's more the former than the latter, just because I can reset a ratio today and then have to reset it in four or five years time if my leasing strategy changes relative to buying. So I would imagine it may just be a carve out at least for a few years, at least to start until there's, you know, history. Any questions on that? That's a one to think about. And also again, this slide too, just thinking about, I might wanna to talk to the guy that, you know, has involvement with, you know, more operations or more facilities or more, you know, because they're probably leasing things and now we're gonna to have to, we're gonna to have to have a little more of a transparent flow of data. A um, couple of things just to think about as far as what takes some time, um, just the complete list of leases and the population contracts takes time, complete list of all my vendors and under, understanding how my service and supply contracts are structured, that's going to take time. Um, I would say that second bullet's a little overly dramatic if you do want a software solution. I guess it could take many months, but it can also be as quick as probably four to six weeks, um, depending on the tool and depending on the vendor. I will say that if you're in a larger com company situation and you do need um, one of the more sophisticated tools, <coughs> such as a visual lease or a lease query, um, they're going to be they're going to start to be very constrained because they've got a limited number of people that are able to be assigned to help implement and configure the tool. So not much to do about it other than think about going ahead and, and kind of exploring that because as it gets closer to crunch time, those software companies are, they're gonna have folks that want a license of their software and they're, they're gonna be, it's gonna be tough for them to find people to help get everything together. And just like anything, you know, limited resources create delays. Okay, I think I'm pretty close to time, Denise. I think I'm over time. I think that's it. I've got some examples. I think the slides will be available. I thank you, FEI, for having having us come and present today. And if there are any other questions, I, you know, our, my, uh, my contact, and I'm sure Roman can be contacted through FEI. And uh, if we can help in any way or, or help answer some questions, uh, happy to do it. Hey, Mike, um, I have questions. Sure. Um, so this is Marcel with Kiriyama. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. The first one is uh, how the new standard impact on income tax? Yep. Um, yep. So the first question, so income tax does not recognize 842. So that's, a, and that's a great one. I probably should add that somewhere. Um, so what happens is now all of a sudden on my balance sheet, I've got these two big balances with no tax basis. So I've got book basis, no tax basis. So what does that do? That creates deferred asset, deferred tax liability. Uh, they're big, right? So even tax affected at 20 some odd state fed, um, big deferreds, uh, they'll net to zero, obviously on the face of the balance sheet in the long-term deferred asset or liability, but in disclosure, those two, not equal, because they're going to be different, but those two big deferred gross balances, those are going to have to be disclosed in your uh, 740 footnote for sure. But there's no income tax implication. Taxes doesn't change. You know, you're paying your leases, you're booking those expenses, you're getting deductions on a current basis. It's really the fact that I've created this artificial book basis and a basis difference that where I never had one. But just keep in mind, you cannot, you can do what you want, but in theory, your auditors would not let you net those in a footnote. So I I don't have to worry to to estimate tax provision no, no. okay. No, well, if you're doing an interim provision like a FIN 18, you're not updating your deferreds every month or every quarter anyway. Um, you're definitely not taking into account anything in your ES payments. Um, but uh, it's really just financial reporting of the deferreds at year end and really just in the footnote, to be honest. You just update your provision work papers, that's all. <laughs>
It's not gonna, but it's not gonna affect your cash tax one one penny. Yeah. Another question. So we have four four subsidiaries and two for manufacturer, two mm -hmm. and two for wholesaler. Yep. And the one of them is outside of US. It, do you have any suggestion or recommendation how okay? Amen. All right, so let's talk about two things. Uh, one is if I've got a subsidiary out, subsidiary outside the US, the way we handle that is we have a lease contract in some local currency, not USD. Right. Right. So I schedule it out in local currency. I apply. Here's the here's the one. It, it depends on how material these things are, but the discount rate is obviously not going to, it could coincidentally, but wouldn't really be the US Treasury T-bill rate, right? Because it it's right. gonna be a, a local concept. And if you go with the idea that we're gonna use risk-free rate generically, if I've got a, 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 a company I'm doing the books for and they're located in whatever country, there's gonna be a risk-free rate analog in that other non-US jurisdiction. So I, I would say that's one thing to think about if it's material. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you, you do the calculation basically in local currency using a local discount rate, and then you just use your normal, um, you know, conversion or not conversion, but translation. Okay. So that's, that's that. Now, let me, let me, let me bring up another thing that people ask about all the time and you, you kind of teed it up. Let's say I've got a group of companies and there are four separate companies. One of them owns a bunch of property. Another one operates, uh, runs an operation. And they actually, there's a setup where the property owner has an intercompany lease with mm -hmm. one of its sibling subsidiaries. We'll make it simple. I got, I got a parent company and two subs. One of them owns property, the other one operates. And I got a holding company. So the question is, is wait a minute. If I've got an intercompany lease, how do I handle that? And the answer is, it depends on at what level your financial reporting is is, is going to be um, considered. If it's a consolidated financial statement, then the, the lease, I mean, like any other intercompany transaction, the <clears throat> intercompany uh, related party transactions would be eliminated in consolidation. It would be nothing. You'd be left showing the fixed assets and, and the intercompany lease would be a zero in consolidation. However, we have had situations where, okay, for consolidation, yes, that's a zero, but I need separate financials for the operating company. Then what? Okay, well, now I have to capture and calculate and bookkeep that lease with its sibling subsidiary. It's a related party lease, but it's a lease, and I treat it like any other lease I have with a non-related party with an outside lessor or landlord. So just think about that if you've got a group that you're working with, then uh, if everything is in consolidation, you know, it'd be worth going through and documenting that. But if you've got separate company financials, then, you know, likely going to have to create accounting for the intercompany lease or related party lease activity, just like any other. Anything else come up? Anything else? Uh, anyone else want to speak up, or Denise? Any other questions, or are we are we good to go? Um, do Do we have any difference um, between uh, manufacturer and wholesale? Is it the same? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you can think of it as well. One thing, uh, in contrast with rev revenue recognition, which was you know, it's very conceptual, it's very artistic, it was very you know, a loose set of principles you would you would really apply to different industries with different consequences. Lease counting is least it's very prescribed. And so whether it's a manufacturer or a hotel or a restaurant or a, a doctor's office or what it doesn't, you know, if you lease property, um, there's a there's an approach to just being methodical, gathering your contracts and accounting for those lease contracts. It, not real industry. The industry specific gets comes into play when you talk about potential for embedded leases. You know, hospitals are full of 
very, very complicated vendor contracts related to medical suppliers, whereas there are plenty of uh, manufacturers or wholesalers and their contracts just aren't going to reveal a lot of embedded leases. They're very straightforward. And so that can dial up or down to complexity, but otherwise um, the, the application of the standard is, it's just very, it's very prescribed. It's very arithmetic, I would say. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Denise, I'm going over. That's okay. Um, I don't have anything else in the chat for you. Okay, well, I, I think that'll, there's other slides. I think Denise can, are you going to distribute the slides if people ask for them, if they really want to? I am. I'm going to send the slides out um, to all participants, and we'll also be posting a recording of the webcast on our um, website. Fantastic. Okay, well, thanks, uh, thanks FEI. Thanks, everyone, for, for the questions and for hopefully uh, hearing about some of our, our uh, practical uh, implementation uh, uh, suggestions. And I appreciate everyone uh, attending. Michael, Thanks. thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.